Jacob Lawrence was born in Atlantic City in 1917. He spent part of his childhood in Pennsylvania. After his parents broke up in 1924, a 13-year-old Jacob went with his mother and siblings to New York, settling in Harlem. Lawrence was one of the first African-American artists to be trained by the black community in Harlem, and he initially obtained professional recognition from the people of Harlem. He was also the first African-American artist to receive sustained support from mainstream art museums and patronage outside of the black community during an era of legalized and institutionalized segregation. Lawrence had relatively little formal training. His mother feared he would be involved with a street gang when he was a boy. Since most of the people who lived in Harlem considered his school number 89 to be a rough public school. So she enrolled him in an arts and crafts after school program in the basement of the 135th street branch of the public library. A young Jacob was assigned to Charles Austin, who was working on his master's, master's degree at Columbia University. His early works captured the essence of Harlem, like this piece called The Street Orator Audience from 1939. The audience, nearly transfixed by the orator's message, is viewed from the speaker's perspective. The soapbox session was necessary for political and social leaders to hone their verbal skills and transmit information quickly through the community. And if you've ever been in Harlem, you know that the street orator is part of the essence of Harlem. His primary objective was to document the legacy of African Americans. The name of this piece is called The Homecoming from 1936. The name of this piece is called Street Scene Restaurant from 1936. He depicted honestly what he saw and knew in Harlem. Street preachers, clinic waiting rooms filled with sick and crippled people, curbstone, checker, checker players, pool halls, social club parades, people working, lovers, and loungers. The name of this piece is called Moving Day 1937. Bored, angry, and frustrated with school, he soon left. As the depression got worse, his mother lost her job. In 1936, when he and his mother had employment, he did a miniature painting until he discovered Austin, who taught in a WPA center. He sent Lawrence to the Harlem Community Arts Center for free classes directed by Augusta Savage. Again, the name of this painting is called Moving Day from 1937. The name of this is called Halloween Sandbaggers, 1937. I had not heard of people being beat in this manner during Halloween, um, but apparently they were. To get their candy, I don't see a bag of candy. The name of this is called Dining Out, 1938. Lawrence's early concentration on patterns helped him to see patterns in architectural decoration, window placements, cornice, subway ties, machines, parades, and humans. Activities of all kinds. Patterns also served to organize and reduce the chaos of his feelings. They brought his life under his control, and at least some of his control. The name of this is called Harlem Diner from 1938. And the name of this piece is called Woman from 1938. Now throughout the 30s and into the 1940s, Lawrence depicted essential issues for African Americans in post-depression Harlem, including the desperate plight of black women, the illness and the disease resulting from living in tight quarters, and with inadequate health care and the prominent role that religion and spirituality played in people's daily lives. Unemployment was a problem in America, but the lives of African Americans were complicated. Lawrence witnessed this with his mother, who lost her job and struggled to care for her children as a domestic. And again, look at this particular piece. He's really captured that feeling of the worn down mother 
or the worn down black mother look at everything around it has that same kind of feeling that blue coat that that looks like a cactus of some sort of plant and look at the colors also after dropping out of college he somehow discovered professor charles surfton discussion of african-american history surfton inspired him to go downtown to the white world to see the exhibit of west african sculpture in the museum of modern art Lawrence began to study the history of black people. He was motivated by his anger at blacks being omitted from history books and his growing pride in black accomplishments in the past. He was especially attracted to the heroism of Toussaint Overture, the Haitian military leader who had overthrown slavery and freed his tiny island country from foreign uh, domination. And the name of this piece is called The Life of Toussaint Overture, from 1938. His Toussaint Overture series shows Haitian people in realistic settings, but without naturalistic details, concentrating on the emotional reality of the struggle. He created a series of 41 paintings inspired by the Haitian Revolution of, 19, of 1795. He wrote each caption himself, and this is what he said under this particular, particular caption. He said, and I quote, he says, the cruelty of the planners towards the slave drove the slaves to revolt in 1776. Those revolts which kept cropping up from time finally came to a head in the rebellion of 1938. And that's what you're looking at, the life of Toussaint Overture from 1938. The combination design of Lawrence's paintings frequently became so inconsistent that it fused figurative elements with their backgrounds, such as the life of Toussaint Overture, Toussaint Captured, Marmalade, and the panel of the life of Harriet Tugman. And again, this is um, Toussaint Overture, number 39, 1938. And this obviously is when Toussaint Overture um, gave himself up um, and the French uh, put him in a uh, dungeon for the rest of his life. This is his next series called John Brown Discussed with Fred Frederick Douglass, Frederick Douglass, number 24 in 1939. And again, he wrote a piece for this, for each one of the images in the series. And for this particular one, number 24, this is what he wrote. He said, and I quote, John Brown discussed with Frederick Douglass his plan to attack Harper's Ferry, an arsenal of the United States government. Brown's idea was to attack the arsenal and seize the guns. Douglas argued against his plan, his reason being that the abolition of slavery should not occur through revolution. And the name of this piece is The Life of John Brown, number six, 1941. And again, he wrote, and I quote, John Brown formed an organization among the colored people of the Arundhati woods who resist the capture of any fugitive slave. The name of this is The Life of John Brown, number 17, 1941, and he wrote again, and I quote, John Brown remained a full winner in Canada, drilling Negroes for his coming raid on Hopper's Ferry. The name of this is The Life of John Brown, number 20, 1941. And he wrote, John Brown held Hopper's ferry for 12 hours. His defeat was a few hours off, end of quote. The name of this is The Life of John Brown, number 22, 1941. And he wrote, and I quote, John Brown was found guilty of treason and murder in the first degree. He was hanged in Charlestown, Virginia on December the 2nd, 1859. And his series, The Life of Harriet Tugman. This is number two, and this is was created in 1940. Again, look at his images, look at the color. The name of this is called The Life of Harriet Tugman, number seven, 1940. And he wrote, Harriet Tugman worked as a water girl to fill hands. She also worked at plowing, carting, and hauling logs." End of quote. 
This is the life of Harriet Tugman, number 22, 1940. And he wrote, Harriet Tugman, after a very trying trip north in which she had hidden her cargo by day and had traveled by boat, wagon, and foot at night, reached Wilmington, where she met Thomas Garrett, a Quaker who operated an underground railroad station. Here, she and the fugitives were fed and clothed and sent on their way, end of quote. In 1941, he painted one of his most popular narrative series called, and I quote, and the migration kept coming, end of quote, on small 18 by 12 inch panels depicted in unsentimental yet emotionally moving images of the mass migration of poor black families from the deep south to northern cities. Lawrence created the scenes from family stories, his childhood, and his experience in rural Virginia. And this is a picture of not all of them, but most of them. He did his research and wrote his captions for 60 panels. Jacob Lawrence gained wide recognition for his narrative painting series called The Migration of the Negro in 1941. Around this time, he became the first African-American represented by a downtown gallery. The even numbers of this series belong to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and the odd number belong to Philip Collection in Washington, D.C. I want to look at a few of his uh, images from the Migration series. This is number one, called Migration of the Negro from 1941, and he wrote, During the World War, there was a great migration north by Southern Negroes, end of quote. This is Migration of the Negro number three from 1941, and he wrote, In every town, Negroes were leaving by the hundreds to go north and enter into northern industry. This is Migration of the Negro number four. And he wrote, The Negro was the largest source of labor to be found after all others had been exhausted. End of quote. This is number five. And he wrote, the Negro was given free passage on the railroads, which was paid by Northern industry. It was an agreement that the people brought North on these railroads were to pay back their passage after they had received jobs." End of quote. This is called the Migration of the Negro number six. And, and I quote, The trains were packed continuously with migrants. End of quote. This is number 10. They were very poor, end of quote. This is number 11. Food had doubled in price in many places because of the war. And this is migration of number 12. And he wrote, the railroad stations were at times so overpacked with people leaving that special guards had to be called in to keep the peace, end of quote. This is number 14. And he wrote, among the social conditions that existed, which was partly the cause of the migration, was the injustice done to the Negro in the court. End of quote. This is number 15. And he wrote, another cause was lynching. It was found that where there had been lynching, the people who were reluctant to leave at first immediately after this. This is Migration of the Negro number 17. The migration was spurred on by the treatment of the tenant farmers by the planters. End of quote. This is number 20. And he wrote, and I quote, In many of the communities, the Negro press was read continuously because of its attitude and it, its encouragement of the movement. End of quote. This is migration number 21, and he wrote, and I quote, he says, families arrived at the station very early in order not to miss their train north, end of quote. This is migration of the Negro number 22, and he wrote, and I quote, another of the social causes of the migrants leaving was that at times they did not feel safe, or it was not the best thing to be found on the streets late at night. They were arrested on the slightest provocation, 
end of quote. This is called Migration of the Negro number 23, and he wrote, and the migration spread. This is Migration of the Negro number 24, and he wrote, and I quote, child labor and lack of education was one of the other reasons for people wishing to leave their homes, end of quote. This is number 25, and he wrote, and I quote, after a while, some communities were left almost bare, end of quote. This is number 26, and I quote, and people all over the South began to discuss this great movement, end of quote. This is Migration of the Negro number 27, and he wrote, and I quote, he says, many men stayed behind until they could bring their families north, end of quote. This is number 29, and he wrote, the labor agent also recruited laborers to break strikes, which were occurring in the North, end of quote. This is number 31, and he wrote, and I quote, he says, after arriving North, the Negro had better housing conditions, end of quote. This is called the migration of the Negro number 32. And he wrote, and I quote, the railroad station in the South were crowded with people leaving for the North, end of quote. This is called Migration of the Negro number 33. And he wrote, people who had not yet come North received letters from their relatives telling them of the better conditions that existed in the North, end of quote. This is called number 34 of Migration of the Negro. And he wrote, and I quote, the Negro press was also influential in urging the people to leave the South, end of quote. This is called the Migration of the Negro number 35. And he wrote, and I quote, they left the South in large numbers and they arrived in the North in the large numbers, end of quote. This is called number 36 of the Migration of the Negro, and he wrote, they arrived in great numbers in Chicago, the gateway of the West, end of quote. This is number 38, and he wrote, they also worked in large numbers on the railroad. This is number 39, and he wrote, luggage crowded the railroad platforms. This is number 40, and he wrote, the migrants arrived in great numbers. This is number 41, and he wrote, the South that was interested in keeping cheap labor was making it very difficult for labor agents recruiting Southern laborers for Northern firms. In many instances, they were put in jail and were forced to operate incognito, end of quote. This is number 42, and he wrote, and I quote, they also made it very difficult for migrants leaving the South. They often went to the railroad station and arrested the Negroes wholesale, which in turn made them miss their trains, end of quote. This is number 44, and he wrote, and I quote, living conditions were better in the North, end of quote. This is migration of the Negro number 47 through number 48. And he wrote, and I quote, as well as finding better housing conditions in the North, the migrants found very poor housing conditions in the North. They were forced into overcrowded and dilapidated tenant housing. This is number 49, and I quote, they also found discrimination in the North, although it was much different from what, from that which they had known in the South, end of quote. This is Migration of the Negro number 50. And he wrote, and I quote, race riots were very numerous all over the North because of the 
antagonism that was caused between the Negro and the white workers. Many of these riots occurred because the Negro was used as a strike breaker in many of the northern industries. This is number 52 of the migration of the Negro and he wrote and I quote he says one of the largest race riots occurred in East St. Louis end of quote. This is number 53 he wrote the Negro who had been north for quite some time met their fellow men with disgust and aloofness end of quote. This is number 53 and he wrote one of the main forms of social and recreational activities in which the migrants indulged included the church. This is Migration of the Negro number 55. He wrote, and I quote, he says, the Negro being suddenly moved out of doors and cramped into urban life contracted a great deal of tuberculosis. Because of this, the death rate was high, end of quote. This is number 56, he wrote, among one of the last groups to leave the South was the Negro professional, who was forced to follow his clientele to make a living, end of quote. This is number 57. The female worker was also one of the last groups to leave the South, end of quote. This is number 58. He wrote, and I quote, he says, in the North, the Negro had better educational facilities end of quote. This is number 59. And he wrote, and I quote, in the North, the Negro had freedom to vote, end of quote. And this is the final panel of the migration of the Negro number 60. And he wrote, and the migrants kept coming, end of quote. The use of these short statements punctuate the middle and the end of the series with the persistence of the migrants and their continued quest north. Lawrence repeated certain words and colors to give the 60 panel creation the lively rhythm of a jazz composition, accelerating the forward momentum of the composition and lightening the persistent and optimism of those migrating north. This series that Jacob Lawrence has created has a profound effect on me each time I see it because I too was part of the great migration from the south to the north. I came to or went to Chicago in the late 50s, early 60s.